Hi guys, it's Ben here, welcome back to another video and today I'm with Ollie Bonds, the owner and founder of Anfield HQ. Ollie, thanks a lot for coming on mate. No problem at all, thank you for having me on. No worries, so the transfer window is finally over, it's been a fucking stressful one hasn't it as a Liverpool fan? Um, obviously you run one of the biggest independent Liverpool websites, how was it for you on the whole this summer? Yeah, it's been, it's been a busy one hasn't it, it's been, um, you know, every, every summer sort of Liverpool expected to be, to be busy but this summer was, was probably more, more, more so than most, um, you know, there, there was so much hype throughout the, the course of the summer and there was so much said and so much reported, you, you know, you, you, at one point you didn't really know what, what was going to come from where. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it, it has been a busy one. I mean, personally, I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy with the summer and um, there's obviously issues which we will probably discuss le later on. But um, yeah, overall, I, th I think it was quite a competent summer for Liverpool. Yeah, um, one of the, the biggest sagas, one that obviously never went away, was the Coutinho one. I mean, there were many sagas, which I guess we'll all talk about uh, during this video, but the Coutinho one kind of stressed us all out the most, probably. Um, suddenly, the, the transfer request came in in August, just for the Watford game. Um, Journalists kind of remained adamant that he wouldn't be sold. Liverpool obviously released a statement, uh, you know, echoing that. Uh, then the transfer request came in. It was all very stressful, and I kind of changed my mind on it a few times whether I thought he was going to leave or stay. Um, obviously, a few days before the window shut, you uh, at Anfield HQ ran with a story um, that he was going to leave uh, for 160 million euros if the right replacements were found. And um, obviously, you tweeted off your personal as well. So just kind of talk me through why you thought he might have been sold for 160 million euros? I mean, I mean well, the entire summer I didn't think Coutinho was going anywhere. Um, you know, Liverpool have come out, FSG have made that statement and they're the sort of owners that once they sort of make a statement like that, they, they stick to the guns. Um, you know, but a, a few days before, um, we were obviously, you know, we were briefed about the, the Naby Keita medical um, and we were, we were briefed that Liverpool were, were going to go, you know, big that week. Um, they obviously wanted Thomas Lamar, uh, you know, Oxo Chamberlain was also on the agenda as well. Um, and obviously once we've been told that Cater was in the country, he was in the United Kingdom, he was going to go for his medical, um, you know, that, that same source sort of briefed us for each story. Mm -hmm. um, so I had no reason to doubt the fact that Coutinho was going to leave. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, you know, Cater had had his medical on a Tuesday, I, you know, Ox was going to get done the next 48 hours, the bids for Lamar had gone in. Um, and you know we were briefed that Coutinho was was, was going to leave. You know a deal had pretty much been agreed with Barcelona, 160 million euros they'd bid before, uh, but Liverpool wanted their replacements in. Um, you know so you know they, they wouldn't you know sell Coutinho, and then the prices for Lamar and, and Van Dijk would, would go through the roof. Um, so I had no reason to, to, to believe that that story was was false. Um, I had no reason to believe I, I was lied to. Um, but you know not all information is right, not all briefs are right, and Coutinho was wrong. Um, but you know. The rest of the stories that week were, were, were true. So, yeah, uh, the fact that the journalist remained so adamant that he wouldn't leave did that make you any hesitant at all to put to put that story up on the website and obviously to go so aggressive with it on on your Twitter as well? Was was the journalist stance making it more difficult for you to put that story out? Uh, yeah, yes and no. I, you know, in, in some respects, I think a lot of the journalists are briefed by the club, um, so a, a lot of them will sort of, I think, have their own opinions. Um, and despite what they get told by the club, um, you know, they're paid to write what what the club tell them. Basically, that, you know, that, that, you know, that, that's what they work for their outlet, that sort of thing. Um, but I think as soon as sort of we we'd run a story, and, and you know, some journalists came out and would define and you know, sort of said, you know, there is absolutely no way Coutinho is going anywhere this mm. summer. Um, you know, it, looking back, um, you know, things probably did did add up to the fact that he wouldn't be going. Um, but as I said, I had no reason to believe he, he wasn't going to go. We ran with the story. You know, we're not the type of site that would run with the story that Absolutely. we didn't, didn't believe in. Um, so yeah, yeah I, you know, there's, there's just two sides to it. But, um, you know, I, look, looking back, it, it was one of those where it just was probably never going to happen. It's, and as a result of that, um, and not just that, I mean, obviously the stuff has happened with Van Dyke as well. It's very easy for people on social media to point fingers at ITKs and to say they're making things up. and. Some journalists maybe have indirectly criticised the ITKs as well, um, not to say that you're an ITK yourself, but there is kind of that ITK side of Twitter versus the journalists. Do you think there is a bit of a divide and almost a bit of a feud between the actual journalists and perhaps fan sites or people, other people that get information from elsewhere? Yeah, I, I think so. I think, you know, journalists are, are pretty proud of their profession. You know, they, they've probably worked it from the, the ground upwards, um, you know, getting stories, you know, from, from when they were, you know, 20 over years, 20 odd years. Um, and they probably do look at, at fan sites and people who, who probably get you know do get external information and probably think they have no right to, to have access to that information. Um, you know, a lot of the, the national press are briefed. You know, they're all they're very close. They're they're all briefed as a pack. Um, you can see that where you know all the information's embargoed and things like that. Um, so you know to see to see some people who should probably yeah don't have the right to have that information come out and, and say they have it um, probably sort of gets under the skin a little bit. Um, but at the end of the day, you know. I, 
I think once you sort of have that information, you have every right to do what you want with it. Mm. Um, you know, you can run a story with it, you can publicize it, you can you can you know tell your Twitter followers it. I, I, I've got no problem against that. Um, it just you know in this case of Coutinho, you know we got it wrong. Um, but as I said, I, I had no reason to believe it was false, and yeah. I wouldn't, wouldn't just put something out on, on social media just you know for for attention or to, to make things that we generally were briefed and, and got told he was off. Yeah, and one thing that you didn't get wrong um, at the time, obviously, it was Van Dijk choosing Liverpool. Mm. Um, but again, you, you, as you just said, you can put that information out if you've got it. Some people don't take too kindly to it. Do you, do you think journalists have a right to be annoyed at you putting information out that maybe they wanted to put out themselves or, or anything like that? Yeah, well, obviously, we, we, had, we had a bit of a problem with, with a, 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 you know, a, a journalist when the Van Dyke story broke. Um, and I, I'd actually you know, I asked about an hour before it came out. I, I did ask someone, I, I, I did say, you know, should we really be putting this out? You know, should we wait? Because there was an embargo on it. It was obviously five o'clock in the afternoon. There was an embargo. Um, and, and I did ask, I said, you know, should, should we wait for this? And, and the response I got was, well, at the end of the day, you've sourced the story yourself. You've got it. You have every right to do what you want with it. No. You're not part of the national press. You've got no embargoes and anything like that. Um, and obviously we, we ran with it and then, you know, in the end it, it didn't particularly end well because, you know, we had, we had a certain journalist kick off at us a little bit um, and, you know, grass us up to, to, to Wasserman and, 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 you know, Van Dyke's agency was on the phone to me the following day uh, and it, you know, it, it wasn't, wasn't the prettiest couple of days um, considering the fact that the, the Van Dyke interest was just blown up completely and, and then obviously, you know, came to a, a halting crash. Um, but I do think certain journalists, uh, as I said, I think they have worked up from the ground upwards and they sort of proud themselves on their, their own profession. They see sort of fan sites who, as I said, probably have no right to have this information posting it. Um, and it probably does get into the screen a bit, I think. And do you think any of this at all, not necessarily your part that you played in the whole Van Dyke thing, but the, the whole press as a whole, and I, I include social media and ITKs in that, do you think any of that played a part in Liverpool not getting the deal done in the end? I don't think so. I, I think you know, whenever Liverpool were, if news was going to come out they were going to sign Van Dijk, you know, it would have blown up just as much as if Liverpool were going to sign, you know, David Silva or anyone like that. I think social media will always blow up uh, when a player of that sort of caliber gets gets linked with Liverpool properly. Um, but a, a lot were criticising the, the the fact that it got leaked, and obviously the fact that it came out that he'd chosen Liverpool before a bid had even gone in. Yeah. Was that just a mistake by Liverpool, or was it a mistake by any anyone else? I, th I think it's got to be it's got to be the club. Um, you know, uh, the, the press were briefed by someone. It's not like they colluded that story on their own. Um, you know, people were saying that it might have been Southampton that briefed them, um, but I, I just can't I can't see that happening. I can't see Southampton wanting to put themselves through that much hassle um, over something like that, uh, unless you know they obviously know Van Dijk wanted to, to to move for a while, but. Yeah, I, you know, someone at Liverpool got it badly, badly wrong, um, and I'm, I'm sure there's going to be some sort of internal review come out. Um, and I, I actually tweeted on my personal earlier today. I, I wonder who or what outlet will run with that story mm. and sort of investigate and find out, you know, who the leak was because it was it was an absolute embarrassment. And and since that, did you ever hear of or think that Van Dijk was actually close to joining Liverpool towards the end of the window? Because the speculation never went away. Some people were suggesting. I mean, or even the journalists were saying that we we're going to go back in for him. The interest is still there, but no bid ever even went in. No, and that's the that's the, the root of the problem. You know, they, the, I don't think Liverpool's interest ever did go away. I think they were very much interested in, but because of everything that had happened, and, and again, it goes back to that that statement FSG made of, of being so definitive in their stance. You know, I, I, I just I, I think they were everything that was said was was written in the last couple of weeks was right. I think Liverpool wouldn't have wouldn't have gone anywhere near Van Dijk if Southampton weren't happy for them to do so. Um, it did baffle me at the, at the time that they put in that statement. We've we've dropped all interest. I think the apology probably would have been enough. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, Southampton, I don't think we're ever going to turn around and say, you know, you you can bid for him. Um, I don't think they're ever going to get rid of him. I don't think they blinked an eyelid at, at, at that transfer request anyway. Um, so it'd be interesting to see what happens now. But I, no, I, I don't know. I, I think every Liverpool fan wanted Liverpool to sign Van Dijk. Um, but I just think that sort of the window dreams were closed. It was it was just, it was inevitable that he probably wasn't going to go anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, one player that we did manage to get in, albeit next year, is Naby Keita, another saga that... You know, again, started all the way in May, June sort of thing, and finally was resolved towards the end of the window. He was another one in which, sort of, again, hate to use the phrase, but the ITKs were sort of clued up on. Um, obviously, you know, Graham Kelly being sort of the, the king of the ITKs this summer, sort of the, the, the man who Liverpool fans, they hang on his every word pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, he remained, you know, confident that Cater would get done. He kept it as his profile picture, and he was privy to the information that he was uh, in England um, you know, the morning that it was announced that he would be, or it was revealed that he would be joining. Do you, did you see that as sort of, was that quite a good moment, do you think, for 
guys like yourself or people that run fan sites or Twitter accounts, you know, who 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 should really doubt these guys? They're not making things up. This actually was true. Graham didn't necessarily announce it, um, sort of as a, as a pure tweet, but he was sort of replying to people, sort of like subtly hinting that Kate was in the UK. Did you see that as a was that a real good moment for for that people of that sort of ilk? Yeah, I, I think so, and I think it was you know that that combined with the fact that Liverpool had just signed Navi Kate, so I, I think it, you know it was such a positive move for the club. Um, I, I think things like that were, were always going to get you know elevated to to some extent. But I, you know, I've spoken to Graham quite a lot over the summer. You know, I've I've got no reason whatsoever to doubt that anything he says is wrong. Um, you know, he's very well connected. Um, he, he, he you know he's, he's proven that with with Oxlade Chamberlain with, with Navi Kate, Van Dijk. He obviously you know thought was very close, but and Thomas Lamar as well, which yeah. was another one which. Uh... You know, again, it all went kind of crazy in the last couple of days, and he, he seemed confident that one was going to happen too. Um, it, it's unfortunate for him, but do you think it's probably slightly unfair that he gets a lot of the stick if if things don't don't go Liverpool's way on day yeah, I, I think a lot of Liverpool fans forget that not all information can be 100% accurate all of the time. You know, people are going to get things wrong, and I, I think it's one of those things on social media where you can you know you can get 100 things, you know, 99 things right and one thing wrong, and people will hang on to the one thing you got wrong. Mm. Uh, I think it's just how social media is, um, but I think a lot of people refuse to accept the fact that, you know, once someone is wrong, then that's it. I think they, uh, you know, credibility is lost. That's, um, and there's been other instances in the past, you know, uh, taking it years back. But I, I mentioned it to you off air earlier, the, the Mario Balotelli saga. You know, every journalist, you know, on, on, on social media and every outlet connected to Liverpool Football Club ran with the story. Mario Balotelli was not going to sign for Liverpool, um, and two weeks later, he was a he was a Melbourne. Um, so you know things. I hate to say, but I think things do change very quickly in football. Um, I think Graham was obviously informed all summer Liverpool were, were going to go for Van Dijk, we were going to place a bid, and in the end, it, it just didn't materialise. Um, and I think things sometimes change too quickly for for people to probably keep up in football at times. Um, but you know, I, I think think there are people on on social media that are very well connected. There's a you know hundred people on there who aren't and just yeah. you know, do it for. That, and that, and that's what's uh, eventually going to spoil it for for those that do know what they're talking about. Those that do have good connections, you know, whether it be yourself, Graham, or whoever. Um, you know, some people that write for your website um, have got good sources. Mm. But there are those accounts that see the attention that guys like yourself are getting, the the following <coughs> the following that you've got on Twitter now, and Graham likewise. They're going to want a piece of the action. It's like when it comes to January, we are going to be back in for Van Dijk and Lamar. It's going to be a similar sort of thing, isn't it? Everyone's going to be wanting to gain new followers. There's a great opportunity to do that. And is that going to spoil it for the likes of you know yourself or people that have actually got the connections that are actually going to give you correct information? A la maybe okay to being in the UK. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I think I think a lot of people do see it, and uh, you know people will see as you said the likes of Graham Kelly, and I mean I, I had a, a crazy couple of days when the Navigator Medical was 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 done because obviously you know the I mean, stuff tweeted up the day before, um, but I think you know if you take everything away from it, I also think it's it's uh, you know a lot of Liverpool fans whether they like or dislike it, it is great fun, it's great entertainment for them at the same time. You know, some people are completely off the mark and completely wrong, and others who do have connections, you know. We'll, we'll tweet, tweet, tweet what they have, um, and I think I think without it, you know, people would probably feel a bit lost uh, because obviously the journalists, as I said, are briefed by the club. You know, some people do their own opinions, but you know, a lot of the summer is sort of going on, as you said, hanging on Graham Kelly's mm. every word. Um, and if he if he deactivated the Twitter account, for example, I think people, you know, a lot of people would probably feel his loss a little bit. Yeah, of um, But yeah, I, you know, I, I think January's going to be. A, I, I, people say it's going to be a busy one, but I'm not sure. You look at Klopp's record in, in the January window, and it's what Stephen Corker and, and Marco Grujic. Yeah. So. I, you know, it's it's going to be an interesting one. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see. And obviously, I'm for HQ. Uh, you you guys are just non-stop at it. Whether it be sourcing your own stories, um, or you know, you probably do hundreds of tweets every single day off that account on Instagram <laughs> as well. And you're obviously you're you're reporting on stuff that other journalists have reported on. So you'll you, you'll say what they've done. You'll give them the, the credit, and you'll you'll link to the article after a few tweets. Even that seems to be rubbing people up the wrong way. Um, yeah. What do, what do you say to suggestions that that's morally wrong or, or anything like that? No, I'm, I mean, I'm glad you, you brought it up because, we, I mean, look, Amphil HQ, HQ has been doing the same thing since we started three years ago. So, you know, we, we're doing exactly the same thing now as we did when we had, you know, 2,000 followers. Um, and we have had a few sort of journalists contact us in the last six months and say, you know, it's, it's getting a bit out of hand. Um, you know, you, you're tweeting half the story and then tweeting the link, that sort of thing, which I understand, I'm, I'm happy with. Um, so, we, you know, we've tailored things for certain journalists where we'll, we'll sort of tweet the link first and then do a couple of reply tweets underneath. Um, but I, at the end of the day, Amphilitsky, there's a reason Amphilitsky is, is so well liked by a lot of people. Um, and that's because, you know, a lot of people use it as a source of news, you know, first thing in the morning or last thing at night. 
Um, and everyone's, you know, people are going to criticise, I completely take that on board, I understand that, um, it's fair enough. Uh, but I, I just think there's a reason Anfield HQ is, is, is what it is. Um, and to some degree I understand journalists' point of view, but, but, but on the other hand I, I don't think a lot of people realise how many sort of hits we send towards outlets. Um, you know, over the course of the transfer window we probably sent, you know, over half a million hits to the Times alone. Um, and I think people sometimes look at that and, and don't sort of see that side of it. They just see it's tweeting the article and that they look at it from the journalist perspective. But we're also sort of sending clicks, which you know they probably wouldn't get if HQ wouldn't ex didn't exist. And um, well, previously, were the journalists a bit more um, receptive to what towards you? Maybe they were, you know, they had a good relationship with you and they were happy for you to be doing exactly what you're doing. And then all of a sudden, have has it has it kind of changed slightly? Well, I, I mean, we used to get journalists on HQ all the time, uh, you know, doing doing interviews and doing podcasts. And I, I do get the feeling that if we sort of went back now and asked them, a lot of them would say no. Um, you know, whether that's because they have a personal issue or, or, or not. Um, but you know, my issue is also the fact that there are hundreds of accounts that do exactly the same thing. You know, people with twenty thousand followers, fifty with you know over a hundred thousand followers that do exactly the same thing. And I don't see them getting sort of you know told off or, or had a word with or anything like that. Um, so I, you know, it's it, it's it's a difficult one, but I don't think Anfield HQ should ever change what it does um, just to appease journalists. Because at the end of the day, we help them out probably more so than than they like to think. And do you think you'll move more towards getting your own stories? Obviously, the Coutinho thing was kind of a uh, one example of that. There have been others as well. I think that one of the Lallana injury stories mm -hmm. maybe was an exclusive a while a while ago, and there've been a few others. Yeah. Do you think not just maybe yourselves, but other sort of fans? I mean, obviously things like Arsenal fan TV's blown up. People are sort of looking at that as as how they want to consume their football analysis, that it's a bit more engaging, obviously get more of the fan side. Do you think with fan sites like yourself that'll be more the case? People are going to be trusting the likes of you and reading the likes of you and your stories as much as they are you know, the Daily Mail or, or the Express? I, th I think so. I mean, earlier this summer we, we were briefed that Emery Chan had agreed to a new contract, which you know, I, I, I still think there, there were discussions and I, I think there were sort of a verbal agreement there. You know, we ran the story with it, but I remember we, we ran that story and then the next day, you know, there were all sorts of people saying, it's done, you know, he's agreed it, brilliant news, there were, you know, sites elsewhere doing stories on it and things like that, so I think Ampel HQ does have a huge influence in that respect, but, you know, it, as things have, have, have come to fruition, that was that was wrong, um, he obviously hasn't hasn't agreed to a new deal, he hasn't signed anything, he obviously wants his release clause. Um, and how, how does that make you feel when, obviously, I mean, it happens in journalism all the time with newspapers and stuff, you, you get stories wrong, how does it make you feel as... As, as a fan, like someone that maybe people have already got question marks over the reliability of it, obviously, as you're not a, you know, you're not a national newspaper, so it may be hard for some people to accept that it is true information. When you get the Chan thing wrong and then the Coutinho thing, is it, oh, fuck's sake, the people aren't going to believe what we say from now on? I, I, I don't know, I, I mean, I, I would think that had Anthony not run stories which we'd, we'd been briefed on, that were not true. Like, you know, we, as you said, we, we've done the Lalana stuff, um, Van Dyke wanted to, to leave, we sort of broke first and, and got, got told off for it. Um, you know, Navigator, we, we were aware of, we didn't run, we didn't actually run a news piece on the site, but obviously I, I, I'd done some stuff on my personal before, so I, I think had we not done that, I'd probably be thinking, you know, you know, why are we doing this? Because everything we're getting told is wrong. Um, but I, I, I just think, you know, think, things change very quickly in football, as I said, and I, I think not all information is going to be right, some is going to be wrong. Um, but you know you have to sort of trust who you speak to, um, and I had no reason, or none of us had any reason, sort of going into that story that it, it was wrong in any. any yeah. So, so, so what is the decision making process? Because I mean, I know that you knew quite early on that Oxley Chamberlain was very likely, but I don't think you put anything on the site about it, mm -hmm. um, even though it was very close. Uh, obviously, it did take a while for deal to get done eventually, but it was close quite early on in the summer. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Um, what made you not? Say you know, oh, exclusive Oxford Chamberlain, very close uh, to signing for Liverpool. I I don't think at the time there was sort of much to run with in terms of a story, um, other than the fact that you know he, he was keen on Liverpool. Um, Jurgen Klopp was very keen on him. Um, you know, he was looking to leave Arsenal. There wasn't really much we could have done story-wise. Um, and obviously you know, there was so much that could have gone wrong. It was just one of those things where we sort of looked at it and, and thought there's probably not enough evidence yet to suggest that a deal will get completely done even though it was likely to um, and I'm, I mean HQ's gone through different stages of, of, of you know moving from full news to, to, to no news at all um, and for us at that time it, you know, we weren't really bothered about clicks or views or anything like that um, it was more about sort of getting the story right so we didn't really feel at the time Oxley Chamberlain was, was worth running with 
But then on the other hand, you know, Chan, we got we got fed a, a whole load of stuff briefed to us about the fact that he'd agreed and he agreed new terms. You know, it wasn't all about the money. Well, it was on a good wage. Um, he was going to, you know, he'd been told by Klopp by the end of the season he was going to play week in, week out, that sort of thing. So there was more to run with on that one. Um, so we, we run with it. Um, but I just think if you sort of look at everything together, you know, we, we run with two stories that were wrong. We've also run with, you know, probably about six or seven that are right. So, I mean, you've probably got like an 80, 20 percentage. Um, and that's sort of why we keep doing it, because there's no reason for us to believe. And you obviously think that everything you put out is right at the time. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and just like any paper, it may not be right. I mean, uh, so has there been a source that's maybe given you a couple of things wrong now that maybe you wouldn't look to go run with a story with again? Well, I mean, it, we've, we've had the sort of same same uh, source briefing us for every single story, so it's not like there's multiple ones. Mm. Um, so, again, it is all coming from the sort of same, same. it's the same guy briefing us, basically, so it's, it's you know, you know it's, there's no reason for us or me to think it's wrong. Ultimately, sort of, I made the editorial decision on it. Um, but you know, as I said, if you sort of look at everything that's gone on, and you look at all the stories we have run with that we've done exclusive to us, you know, th there is a lot more right than wrong. Yeah. Um, so to this day, you know, if, if if we got told next week that um, you know Emery Chan was was going to be sold in January, we'd, we'd probably run with it mm -hmm. um, because I, I, again, I'd have no reason to, to think it's wrong. Um, but but some information is wrong, and I think it's just one of those things that you just got to just get on with and. Thank you, going. And on the subject of Emery Chan, do you think, based on what you've heard, do you think he he will sign? Well, I mean, I mean, we obviously ran with it in the summer. We, we said he'd agreed terms. Um, I, I think he's had talks with Klopp, and you know, I, I personally think he has agreed verbal terms with with Klopp. I think he was sort of waiting to see what Liverpool did in terms of getting into Champions League, what they did in the summer transfer window. We've got Navi Cater in next summer, um, and he also obviously news has emerged. He wants his release clause, but I actually think you know it's, it's probably sensible after the summer we've had. Um, you know, if Cham finds himself. In a year's time, on the bench, Navi Keita starting ahead of him with Henderson and Wijnaldum. You know, he's, he's going to be thinking, I want to be playing regular games, um, and if I've got no release scores, how do I get out of it? Um, so I, I think we're going to see a lot more players sort of do, do that similar thing. Um, but you know, chance free to speak to other clubs as of January the first. Um, so it's you know, there's not much time for Liverpool to get something done if they are to do it. Uh, but I, I would be disappointed to see him go. I think he's a, he's a, he's a brilliant young player. I think he's, he's got a bright future ahead of him. And I think Liverpool's and, and Klopp's probably the perfect place for him to, to develop. Do you think Van Dijk will end up at Liverpool? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, I, I really, I, I just, there's part of me that just thinks Liverpool had the chance with Van Dijk and they've, they've sort of blown it. And the other side of me also thinks that Southampton will never sell to Liverpool just to make a point. You know, mm. this summer was about making statements from, from Liverpool, from Southampton. And I just, I'm not sure whether Samson will sort of waver from that um, with Liverpool. But on the other hand, you know, if Liverpool cough up, you know, if, I said this the other day on a podcast, if, if Van Dijk gets to December and his, his head's not there, he, he might be there, but his head is, is gone. Um, you know, he's not good for the manager. Pellegrino decides, you know, he's, he, this isn't good, he's not healthy for the squad. Samson may listen to offers and I think Liverpool will, will then be ready to sort of pounce. Um, but I just think until that sort of point comes where Pellegrino makes the decision that Van Dijk can't, be around the squad anymore, then nothing will happen. And final question, um, how do you see Philip Coutinho integrating back into the side? Obviously we've got Man City at the weekend, I'm, I'm so excited for that, I think we can do a job on them, but mm. uh, do you see Coutinho featuring there, do you see him featuring long term as far as this season's concerned for Liverpool? I, I think he'll probably go on the start on the bench on Saturday, I don't think Klopp's got any reason to change it, I think it would be a bit unfair on the current personality if he was to change it. Um, but you know, from Coutinho's point of view, you know, he wants that move to Barcelona next summer. He's got to have a good season. He's got to perform. It's World Cup year. He, he's going to want to play for Brazil next year. So I think he's he's got to do what Suarez did: come back, reintegrate himself, and just have the season of his life. Um, you know, it's probably the least he can do for Liverpool after the summer we've had. Um, so I think I think that's what he's, he's sort of got to be aiming for. Um, and if he if he if he wants that move as badly as he says he does, then he, you know he's, he's got to sort of do his talking on the pitch now for the next twelve months. Absolutely. Oh, cheers for coming on, mate. No worries. Well, that, nice stuff. Guys, right, hope you enjoyed the video. I will leave Ollie's Twitter and Ampel HQ's Twitter in the description. I'll obviously leave Ampel HQ link to their website in the description too. Hope you enjoyed the video, guys. Please do subscribe to my channel for more of this sort of stuff. Leave a comment on what you thought of the interview with Ollie. And please do drop a like, subscribe, comment, all that sort of stuff. And follow me on my other socials, Ben Might Say, on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat and Facebook. I'll see you next time.